Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Sorry, a little discombobulated this morning. Didn't get home till 2 a.m. And it wasn't because I was out, you know, having a lot of fun. I was driving back. So anyway, so I do apologize. Good morning. Happy New Year to those who I may not have seen. Um, to everybody. Um, just wanted to remind you, hope you are enjoying this nice cold weather. You guys look great, all bundled up. Hey, man. Everybody all snuggled up. Um, and if you're willing, if you want to get even closer and more warm, join us right after for our time um, together in Sunday school, because that's a great time to get warmed up Amen. and to get all of that warmth that you need from one another. And I do have a Bible verse for you. I did not forget. Um, so it's the gift of fellowship, basically, is what this is about. This is Psalm 55, 14. And it says, we took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want from you. So on this day when it's nice and chilly outside, come and get that counsel. Come and get that good company and join us right after. And bless you. And now I'm turning it over to your awesome worship team. Awesome. Well, I say burr like a true Floridian. <laughs> right? <laughs> I know some people had to bring in some stuff, like my mother-in-law had to bring in her orchids and everything like that because it's because it got so cold last night, right? But it's nice, though. I like the change. Let's all stand up. And let's just focus on the Lord. Amen? Amen. Forget about ourselves and magnify his name. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes Father, open the eyes of my heart Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lift. in the light of your glory pour out your power in love as we sing holy 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 open the eyes of my heart lord open the eyes of my heart i want to see you amen i want to I see want see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 let's sing that out, holy, 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 you are holy. Holy, holy, I want to see you. Holy, 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 you are holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. To see you high and lift. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Amen. Praise God. We live Praise by faith God. and not by sight. Amen. Amen. Yes. So it's a prayer that our hearts would be open Amen. to know his promises are true. Amen. All right. Well, it's been um, a little bit of a rough week um, for myself, if I'll be honest. And uh, in times when it's rough, sometimes we want to just go to a place on our own and not really talk to anybody. Um, but it's a reminder to remember that when we're down in the valley, we need to look up and our Heavenly Father, 
for that Amen. hope, right? Our eyes are set there. Praise God. And when we call on his name, he answers. His arm is not always in the time we want. It's not always in the way that we want, but he answers. Yeah. He doesn't promise to take away the problem, but he promises to get you through it. And um, I just want to remind you of that in case that comes up for you in your life, as it will, right? We all end up going through these valleys and these, these mountaintops. And, um, and then we're on that mountaintop to praise him and to thank him for getting us there, right? Because we didn't do that on our own. So um, as we go into this time of worship, this song is called The Heart of Worship. It's remembering that we're not just singing a song or a song in itself. He wants us, he wants our hearts. He wants us to worship him, Amen. not just in this song, but in our lives. And it's just yes. this song is a reminder and an yes. outpouring of how we can live that out. Amen. Amen. So let's glorify his name because it is good. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless world. King of endless world. No one could express. How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper with it through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. Amen. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Father. All about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you. our communion time. And I'd ask you to be seated. We're going to just go to him with prayer first. You may be seated. Father, thank you for this freedom and ability to just come here and worship you in song. 
forget about ourselves and focus on you and your holiness. Sometimes when we look about ourselves, things may not seem very promising. But when we look to you and we look to Jesus, we look to our Lord. Amen. We see it so clearly. Thank you, Jesus. So simple yet so profound. We came back from this Christmas season. I remember to help us, babe, and how you entered this sinful world and took it upon yourself. You carried that weight all through your life up to the point carrying a cross and dying for our trespasses. Amen. So when we go through our suffering, I pray that we would glorify you in that. Remember that you made a way One day, every tear, every pain, all sorrow will pass away. Amen. Because we know as we die with you and are buried with you, just as you have risen again, we have also risen again in your resurrection. So as we take this time to just put away any distractions, any other of the many little problems that we think are so big in our lives, pray we would just focus on that, on that promise, our hope that should keep us going, gets us up in the morning to know that you have our end in mind. Amen. And you will not leave us where we're at. It's a beautiful thing, Father, that when we cry out for you, when we say, Abba, Father, when we say, Father, I surrender to you. No matter where we were before, then that you welcome us and take us in. You adopt us into your family and make us your children. God, remind us that it's not anything that we do that we may boast. That we're reminded of the cross and the sacrifice that you made so that we can have that joy and that peace and hope to know that we are children of the God most high, who's most holy, and we are cloaked in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, simply through our faith in his grace. So Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness on the cross. May we remember this time and just focus On that promise we have in you. In our prayer, amen. Amen. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you our salvation, our hope of heaven, our hope of making it through this life to the next life is all because of you. We thank you that you paid the price on the cross for the big issue that separates us from God and from you. You took care of the big problem, the problem of sin. And we look at these elements that we're holding and we remember your body that was freely given for us and your blood that ran down from your wounded feet and hands and brow that paid the price for all our sin. So this morning, as we focus on you, we receive this bread that represents the body of our Lord Jesus. You may eat the bread and be thankful.
The hymnist said there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Thank you, Lord, for that possibility, for the reality of that experience of knowing that our sins have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. You may drink the cup and be thankful. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's just take a moment as Denise is playing and let's just offer to God a prayer of thanksgiving in your own heart as we continue to worship. be unto God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Praise God. Well, let's stand up and sing this song that we are all familiar with, I believe. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Believe it. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. But the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus all oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, all oh, precious is the flow. This is all my hope and this is all my peace. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my righteousness. This is all my righteousness. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Amen. All right. And we're going to end with that solid rock. So we know that Jesus Christ, again, we don't have to go to some self-help book or anything like that to clean our act up, right? 
Jesus cleans us up, right? And so when all else is falling around us, we know that that solid rock will stand. Amen. Amen. Praise God. children's shirts that's a good question is gina are you saying yes so then they are then the children all right. are dismissed at this time and you all may be seated children's sigh a big sigh of relief thank you thank you gina all right So on Monday morning, when you don't feel like you're on anything solid, <laughs> or about Wednesday evening, and you have the rest of the week to go, what do you do? And I know that many of you, including myself, we, we experience those times. And, you know, this is why it's important for us to be here uh, once a week it's to be reminded of that. Really, we really are on solid ground. I mean, around, around us, it seems like everything is giving away. And uh, I think in the Old Testament, there's a scripture that says when the foundations, when, when the foundations are falling apart, then, then what do we do? What, what do the righteous do? Uh, and it seems like the foundation of everything in our society and, and culture uh, is, is at least shifting. Um, so I, I want to encourage you this morning um, by, by reading the scripture that helps us in these kind of times to, to maintain our sense of priority. Um, there's distractions all the time, every day, uh, especially in our culture in which last week we talked about being overloaded, overwhelmed, overexposed, um, when, we, when we simply view and have access 
of so many bits of information. Um, it, it's so easy to get distracted. Um, you know, 20 years ago, you had to sit down in front of the TV to get distracted. Uh, now we carry it in our pocket, right? All the reminders, all the requests, all, all, all the deadlines, all the expectations of other people, we have it right here, right here in our pocket. And, and it dings and rings and, and, and we check it uh, all day long. Uh, so I think, I think that dealing with distractions is, is more difficult now than, than it ever has been because there's so many different ways that we can be distracted. But John reminded the church about what was important. Uh, in 3 John, and if you know your Bible, you know that there's only one chapter in 3 John. So uh, 3 John, uh, at the very beginning, uh, John gives this greeting and this blessing, and he, and he puts it like this. He says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. Now, that's wonderful in and of itself, right? Because John is saying, I hope you succeed in every area of your life. I hope that you have good health. I hope that you prosper. I hope that you live uh, under the blessing and the approval of God. But he says, he says that first, and then he says, I hope you have good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So he's putting the care of your soul at the top of the list. I hope that you succeed and that you prosper and that you have good health while your soul is prospering. You see, soul care is something that more and more we're tempted to give less and less time to. I love the old hymn in the hymnal that says, take time to be holy. Now, that's not theologically deep. That's a very practical hymn, right? That reminds us that it takes time and effort and intentionality to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Spend much time in secret and with his word. Uh, that's never changed. I don't know how long ago, how many hundreds of years ago that hymn was written, but it's still true today, is it not? Amen. That a relationship with God, a growing, deepening, effective relationship with God takes time to develop. And John establishes the priority here that when your soul prospers, then everything else in your life will prosper as well. And you will, you will succeed. You will be blessed by God. Now, that doesn't mean that you will never have a bad day. That doesn't mean that you will never experience any pain in your life. But, but John establishes a priority here. Um, soul care is of utmost important. Uh, he goes on to say that it makes it brings me great joy to know that you are faithfully walking in the truth. You have to know the word in order to be able to faithfully walk in the truth. Then he says you're not only walking in the truth, you're not only learning and absorbing the word of God, but he said that's causing you to love your brother. He said, I want to thank you for what you're doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you, to you. They didn't know these people, but they were helping them. They, 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 they were providing for them. And this is what happens when we give attention 
to our souls. Uh, throughout Scripture, uh, the Bible reminds us that our inner self, our inner life must be cultivated. It must be cared for. And like a garden, it has to be uh, watered and fertilized and it has to be watched and observed. So th the title of my sermon today is Pay Attention or Give Attention to Your Souls. You see, healthy souls are good for a lot of reasons. Unhealthy souls are risky. A healthy soul recognizes trouble a long way off. A healthy soul will discern by the word and by the spirit that something may not be best for me. It doesn't have to be sin. It doesn't have to be bad. But, but a healthy soul recognizes what is good, what is bad, and what is best. And if our souls aren't healthy, then we'll find, we'll find ourselves succumbing to the subtlety of Satan in saying, well, that's not really that bad. It's not really a sin. But if it's a distraction, if it, if it distracts you from what is best, then we should avoid it. Because that's how we care for our souls. So having a healthy soul is, is so important. A healthy soul will help us to recognize evil a long way off. Uh, I love the admonition that Paul gave to Timothy when he said, shun evil. No, is that what he said? No, he said, shun the very appearance of evil. And we have a tendency in our culture today to say, well, it's not listed in the Big Ten. And it's okay if, you know, if I don't hurt anyone else but myself. Uh, Paul said, shun the very if it." If it looks like it, if, it's, if it smells like it if, it, if it looks like it could become bad, avoid it. Stay away from it. Uh, th th this, this, is, this is soul care, and the care of our souls is so important. Daily distractions are often what keep us from giving attention to our souls. Let's make a, let's, let's do a definition here of what I'm referring to in this sermon as a distraction. A distraction is that which pulls our attention away from what matters most, from what matters most. A distraction is something that pulls our attention away from what matters most, from what is important. Mary Oliver, an author, said, Attention is the beginning of devotion. You know, what, what gets your attention? What causes you to focus on something? Uh, that's, that's where devotion begins, is when it gets our attention. So the question of the morning for us should be, what are you distracted from that you should be devoted to? What might you be distracted from that you should be devoted to? I'm sure that if you've read Corey Tin Boone's books, you've, you've heard her say this, that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Because either way, your soul will shrivel. You've heard the phrase, the barrenness of busyness. And when it comes to our spiritual life, busyness usually just produces barrenness, emptiness. Uh, several years ago, there was a Harvard study done by two men, two psychologists, who studied uh, the mind and how we think and how we process thoughts 
And uh, after a lot of uh, questions and a lot of interviews, they discovered this, that 42% of the time, 42% of the time that we are in any given moment and any given place, we are thinking about something other than that moment and that place. Now, I don't know how in the world they could figure that out. But they had to ask a lot of questions and get a lot of really uh, honest answers. But their conclusion was this. The ability to think about what is not happening, follow me? The ability for us to think about what is not happening at the moment is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. And I'm sure you found yourself there. You're sitting across the table. You're talking to your wife. You're talking to your wife, but maybe you're not listening. And she goes, over here, look, look, look over here. I, I'm over here. <laughs> Don't look at the TV. Don't look at your phone. I, I, I'm right here. You know, we're, we, we've just figured out how to, how to be in the moment, but mentally not in the moment. And that's a trick of Satan, is to get us distracted because I'm convinced that there are many times in a given day when the Holy Spirit would like to speak to us in a moment. And because we're not there, we're thinking about, we got 14 things left to do today on our list of 20, and I'm running behind, and I don't have time to be in this moment. And we lose spiritual ground because of our ability to think outside of the moment or ahead of the moment. You see, a distracted life leads to disordered priorities. A distracted life keeps us from the beauty of the present moment. A distracted life limits our capacity to love others and to experience personal joy and peace. You see, Satan is very subtle in the way that he comes to us in an attempt to shrivel our soul. Satan will get us to be distracted from the best thing by a good thing. Many of us miss God's best because we settle for what is okay, what is normal, what is average. Oh, well, that's not that bad. But if it distracts us or derails us from the path of, of experiencing the best God has for us, then that's not a good thing. A distracted life blurs the lines between what is urgent and what is important. I love this phrase, and I've used it for many years on my kids. Your lack of planning doesn't constitute an emergency for me. Have you heard that? I love that. <laughs> because other people's issues always seem to break in on us, right? And sometimes because we're the parents or we're somehow obligated, we just we just drop what is important and we and we try to take care of what's urgent. We try to take care of the alligators that are nipping at our heels. And just, I, I, I got to have some peace. And, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll help you with your, with your deal, with, with your urgency. When in reality, that's not important. It's just urgent. And many of us spend our entire day just taking care of things that are urgent. And at the end of the day, we haven't done anything that's important. We haven't accomplished anything that matters. It's not easy to discern what's important versus what's urgent. 
or what is a legitimate responsibility. But I will offer this little piece of advice today that most always, if you're having a hard time figuring out what's important, most always relationships are what's important. If it has to do with my relationship with my family, my spouse, my children, uh, my job, uh, my God, uh, the word, uh, those relationships are what matters most. Those relationships are what's important. You see, relationships have eternal consequences. Think about this for a minute. What do you have that you may possess that you're going to take with you when you die? Well, you know the answer to that. Nothing. Zero. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of what you have right now is going to end up at the city dump or the county dump, probably even before you die if you live long enough. I don't know about you, but the longer I live, the more I want to get rid of junk. You know, I'm really quick to throw stuff out now. <laughs> the people that share my dumpster, they just, they, they love, they love it when Gary comes with, you know, a two-wheeler full of stuff. Because if I don't need it, and if I haven't opened that box for five years, I don't even open it. I just go throw it away because I don't need it, right? Lighten your load. <laughs> yes. Un unburden yourself of all the stuff that uh, we've accumulated. So back to my sermon. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that you can take to heaven, the only thing that you can take to heaven are the people in which you have invested Jesus in which you have invested your faith. Those are the only, that's the only thing that you will see in heaven that you've had anything to do with in this life. And that's what really matters. The people in your life that you've shared Christ with, the people in your life that you have prayed for, that uh, the children that you have dedicated and baptized and, and paid big money to send to Christian schools. And, and uh, you know, we could just go on and on. Those are the relationships right now that matter. That's what's important for us. You know, in Luke chapter 10, there's a story that all of you know. You've, you've read it, and we've talked about it in Bible studies, and you've heard countless sermons on it. It's when Jesus uh, was invited to the home of Mary and Martha. And, <clears throat> and uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, uh, won't take the time to, to turn to it or read it, but uh, you know the story well. Jesus is invited to dinner. And Mary chooses to sit, um, if it was like a modern home, she would, she, would, she would be in a separate room from the kitchen, and she's seated at the feet of Jesus just listening to him and learning from him. And uh, Martha, is, Martha is focused on the meal, okay? Uh, and not just, not just a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or... <laughs> Not just a bowl of soup uh, or hummus, I guess if it's Middle Eastern, it would be. Not just some hummus and some pita bread. But she was putting together a spread, a five-course meal. And, and she was working hard at it, and she was focused on it. And, and she began to develop an attitude towards her sister over it. And the more she worked, uh, the, the, the more anxious she became, and... I think if they had utensils back then that clanged and banged in the kitchen, I think she was probably banging on things and letting her sister know that I'm doing all the work in here and you can come in and help me anytime. And she gets to the point where she's so anxious that she tells Jesus, 
She tells Jesus to tell her sister to get in here and help. And I, I love the way Jesus dealt with this situation. Um, you know, Jesus didn't scold Martha. He didn't say, you're wrong and she's right. <laughs> no, he was wiser than that. And he simply said, Mary has chosen what is better. Mary knew the difference in that moment of what was important versus what was urgent. I'm sure she could sense the tension rising in, in that kitchen. But she chose what was important. And Jesus said, Jesus said to Martha, 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 called her name twice. I think he was trying to bring some calmness to the situation. Martha, Martha, you are concerned about many things. Now, this is interesting if you study this, these particular words in this passage. Um, there are a lot of scholars who believe that the reference to many things that Jesus said to Martha meant in the literal sense that Martha, you, you are preparing a big spread with five courses. You, you are concerned about, about a big deal here, but we only need one thing. Yeah, one bowl of hummus and a little bread <laughs> would suffice. There are, there are many scholars who believe that that's what Jesus meant when he said those words. Of course, there are others that say that, that Jesus, when he said only one thing matters, was the one thing that Mary had chosen versus what Martha had chosen. And it doesn't really change the meaning of this passage because G Jesus makes it clear that Mary chose the right thing. Mary made the best choice in this situation. So there wasn't a right or a wrong. There wasn't one action or response that was sinful and the other was holy, obedient. But there was a best in this situation. And if we, if we really want to care for our souls, we have to be able to discern many times between what is okay, what is acceptable, what is good, or what is best. And we want to choose what is best. And when we choose what is best, we grow on the inside. Our inner life is nourished. And we find ourselves walking closer and closer to God. See, priorities aren't about right versus wrong. They're about what's better or what's best. What's better or what's best. And Jesus' point here is that Mary chose, and that's a key word here, Mary chose what was best. We can choose not to live a distracted life. It boils down to that. It's very simple. We either choose to stay on the treadmill of life and, and accomplish little, uh, and we can stay there if we have the right medication and <laughs> the right counselor. Uh, but th that, I don't think that's the way God intended for us to live. So living a distracted life or not, is up to us. It's a choice that we make. So I want to conclude this morning by giving you three little questions by which you can evaluate your life. You can establish some priorities. And th these are very practical and very, very, very everyday and very, very daily things, okay? Um, I've discovered at my age, 
that <laughs> an, old, an old truth that I've known all along, but sometimes I've denied it, and sometimes I've tried to do something different, but it's this. How you start your day matters. Isn't that true? How you start your day matters. You know, I heard a, a crazy person one time say that, not really crazy, but that's just, I heard a person say one time, well, the morning time is not any more spiritual than 12 o'clock noon. And that's true. It's, it's not. When we, when we look at minutes, but this person was saying that you should, you should pray and you should have your devotions at the, at, the, at the very best time of the day when your mind is clear. And all the people that hated mornings said, amen. <laughs> but you know, by noon, your, your, your day is kind of like half over. And I've discovered that how I start my day has a way of setting the pace for the rest of the day. Amen? It's just that simple. And if, if, I don't, if, if I don't maintain my focus in the morning when I get up, if I don't maintain my focus on what's important, then somehow I lose that focus and I'm involved in other things that aren't important. They're not bad. Uh, they're not even good. <laughs> you might say they're good, but they're not best, and, and they're not what's important. And that's the way Satan has of getting me off track early in the day. Uh, for example, the other day, I, I, I went out to my little patio, and I took my Bible, <clears throat> and I took another little religious book that I wanted to read, and I took my cell phone. And you're like, setting yourself up. That's not good, right? Leave your Bible in the house. Leave the other book in the house. But no, I tried to tell myself, you can do it, Gary. You can, you can stay focused on the Word. And you know, so I started reading the Bible. And all of a sudden, this question comes up. And what do you do when you have a question about the Bible? You Google it, right? And now I'm on my phone. And then I saw who had texted me earlier that morning. And so I'm like, okay, this, I'm off track already. So I finished reading uh, what I was reading. And I just thought to myself, well, maybe I should read this book. So I picked, I picked up the good book, the good religious book, and started reading in it. And it, it got my attention for a little while. And then... And then my wife came out and sat down with a cup of coffee. And, you know, I'm not going to say, hey, will, will you just stay in, 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 in the house? I, 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 I'm, no, you don't do that. You say, it's so good to see you. And I'm so glad you brought your coffee out to have it with me. But an hour and a half later, I hadn't read. I hadn't read what I wanted to read in the scripture. And I really hadn't read enough in the good book, the religious book, uh, to really satisfy me. So... I'm, I'm distracted. And it's so easy to get distracted when you don't stay focused on what's important. What was important that morning was this. Amen. That's what was important. Um, and I'm learning all over again how to not be distracted by all of the things that we have to help us get distracted by. And it's not easy. Uh, but we have to keep the focus. Uh, so how do you start your day? The mornings, most of the time, determine your day spiritually, emotionally. It sets the pace for your day. And maybe you need a system. Maybe you need to think through that. And maybe you need to say no to some things and figure out how to start your day where your soul and your soul care gets your attention. Second question is, what can only you do? What is it that only I can do? See, that's really important. What is it that I'm going to do today that only I 
can do today. If you're a dad, only you can be a father to your children. If you're a husband, only you can be the husband to your wife. Only, only fathers and dads and husbands can be the spiritual leader in their home. That's important. That can't be left undone. That can't be turned over to the youth pastor or the Sunday school teacher or the small group leader. You are the dad. You are the husbands. You are the father. You are the spiritual leader of the family. You are the provider for your family. Now, I'm just using dads as an example here. I don't mean to put a heavy weight on the, on the men here today because there's only certain things that, that moms can do. Moms can be the mom to their children. No one else can be the mom. You don't want anybody else being the mom, right? You're the mom. What can only I do? Whatever the answer to that is, is important. Now, here's the third question. The last question is, where can I choose better? In what area of my life can I choose better or best over okay or just good enough? Where should I be choosing best or better? You know what you need to do with that question? You need to ask your kids that question. They'll tell you. They'll tell you where you can do better. You need to ask your spouse that question. He will tell you. She will tell you where you can choose best and better. And you know, we need to ask the Holy Spirit that question when we pray every day in the morning. <laughs> Holy Spirit will be faithful to tell you where you can choose what's best. Your soul is so important. Your soul needs soul care and love and cultivation. And as we start this new year out, I just wanted to remind you today that what is best is what is best for you and your family and your church and your relationships with other people. And I want to pray with us uh, this morning uh, as we leave this place that we will be able by the help of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to discern what is best and what is better and we will not be sidetracked by what is urgent uh, Denise would you like to come and, and play something for us uh, on the piano as we just let's just take a moment here at the close and let's think about ourselves uh, the psalmist said search me O God and know my heart try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Uh, there's time for self-evaluation and there's, there's, there's time for introspection. Not all the time every day, but occasionally it will do us good. It will do our soul good for us to examine our soul. So with our heads bowed and eyes closed, how do you start your day? Think about that. How can we do that in the best way, in the best way? 
What is it that God has given me to do that only I can do? There are a lot of helpers that we have in our lives, like good pastors and good Sunday school teachers, good youth pastors, scout leaders, and school teachers. But we can't turn our kids over to them. We can't, we can't not do what God has called us to do because they're there doing what they do. And then where can I choose best? What am I doing that I'm just getting by? I'm okay with good. But God would have me move up and, and choose best. Holy Spirit, search us and know you know us. And the scripture says that the heart can be desperately wicked. And the psalmist asked the question, who can know what's in our heart? And the Holy Spirit knows. And the Holy Spirit wants to make us holy from the inside out. And I pray the Holy Spirit would speak to us this morning as we evaluate these very practical things in our life. Help us. As John observed in that New Testament church, it gives me much joy to know that you are walking faithfully in the truth. And Lord, give us the courage to walk in the truth of what you tell us today about ourselves and our priorities and what's, what's best for us. We ask in your name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for being here today. God bless you. And join us for Sunday school. Amen. Discipleship. Adult fellowship. Whatever. Just come right on over and join us. Have a warm cup of coffee. All right. God bless you.